Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks for being here tonight and um, different location. I'm uh, visiting family in Toronto for a few weeks. So we have a starry, a different kind of starry background here. Um, and tonight's talk was inspired by a comic that I saw, like a cartoon comic um, going around uh, on social media this week. And uh, it's a picture of somebody uh, in a jail cell and maybe some of you saw it, uh, reaching through the bars of the jail cell, they have a stick. Somehow they got a stick, which is uh, fortunate. And um, just past the bars, you need the stick to reach it. And they're reaching through the bars and on the floor outside of the cell is a loaf of bread. And the, the person in the image is very emaciated looking and obviously hungry and needing that nourishment. And also near that um, outside of the cell is the key, the key to the door of the cell. Um, and the person in the image is reaching for the loaf of bread. Yeah, so it, it's, um, This is a tricky image because <laughs> my, my mind says, well, get the bread and then get the key. Like they're both there, <laughs> they're both there. So you have to add in your mind a jailer coming by with a broom and they're gonna sweep away whichever one you don't choose because you could just nourish yourself with the bread and then get the key and get out. But that's a, a moot point. So I had to add in a, somebody sweeping away the, the choice that you don't pick. To, for it to make sense in my mind. Um, and so this image is a, a symbol for me. Um, I don't know what the author meant by it. I, I read someone else's piece about it and I'm not sure if they're the one that did the cartoon because it didn't have anyone's name on it or credit. So um, that's why I'm not sharing the image because I don't have the credit for it. Anyways, uh, it's a symbol of of being entrapped, being imprisoned, and what do we reach for? What do we think is going to give us freedom? What do we think is going to give us happiness? What do we think is going to help us feel better? Um, and it reminded me of... Uh, one of the tattoos I have that uh, some of you heard the story of, but it's kind of a stylized mosquito. I can't really turn my wrist enough, but it's a mosquito. And um, most people don't tattoo mosquitoes on their body, but it, this was a story told to me by, told to a group of us as, from a, on a yoga retreat uh, by Swami Mukti Dharma. And it's a retelling of an old Indian tale of a blind person that lived their whole life in a walled community, in a safe community where they were with other folks and they were, you know, protected and, and part of um, safety and community. Uh, and eventually this person has enough skills and reaches adulthood and, and has learned how to navigate their way in the world and would like to, has decided to leave the community and go out into the world. Um, this story originally is an Indian tale and a tale from India. And so you could picture a hot summer India weather and this person uh, packs up all their belongings and say their farewells to those dear to them and they go to the wall the stone wall and feel their way along and they couldn't they couldn't find the gate they couldn't find the way out 
Um, so, you know, they spend a fair bit of time doing that, going all the way around, feeling the way along and couldn't find the gate. So very puzzling and I imagine aggravating. Uh, I could be projecting that, but I think that would be pretty aggravating. <laughs> and so they then go to the elders of the community and say, um, I'm I'm ready to head out and um but I couldn't find the the gate, I couldn't find the way. Uh they say, Oh, blessings to you on your journey, and we'll watch this time and make sure you find your find the gate. And uh they send send this person on their way. Um so they go back to the wall, and now it's later in the day, hotter, they're more stressed, a little bit annoyed, you know, want ready to get going, and they've had to spend all this time. So and they go back to the wall, feeling the way along. And if you've been to India, the the mosquitoes come. And so they're feeling the way along. It's hot and they're they're um swatting away at the mosquitoes and and then going back to the wall. And once again they miss the gate they miss the opening because they've gotten distracted by life's little annoyances the mosquitoes so it's a symbol for me a reminder to not that the opportunity for freedom for liberation for escape from samsara which i'll explain in a moment is always there always there, always there. <laughs> and it's whether how we're meeting each moment, whether or not we're seeing it, missing it, or whether we're um, finding that freedom moment by moment, or the ultimate freedom, Nibbana. Okay, so I just threw a few poly words in there that I should explain. Um, Let me just, yeah, that made sense. So um, Joseph Goldstein, who's a well-renowned Dharma teacher in the West and um, said that, says this, perhaps the most profound part of the Buddhist teaching is the description of the wheel of life. So I mentioned that just a moment ago, the wheel of samsara of re-becoming, the wheel of rebirth that keeps rolling on and on and on, of life and death, life and death. And different, depending on your belief system and different interpretations, this re-becoming can be seen as moment by moment. Am I creating a self? Yes, <laughs> over and over and over, or not. Um, or it could be seen as reincarnation and um, ongoing lifetimes. So it's way too much to go into that whole teaching. It's got 12 links of what are called dependent origination that the Buddha awoke to on after on the night of his awakening, um, awakening from this wheel of re-becoming, this cycle of re-becoming. Uh, and uh, so it, as Joseph says, it's said that on his the night of his enlightenment, the Buddha worked backwards through this law of dependent origination, seeking the place of release, looking for where is that release, the opening of that gate, the freedom from the cage, the getting off that hamster wheel of recreating a self um, that's always in struggle. Um, so there's, we can find freedom at any point in this chain, these 12 links of becoming, but there's two places in particular that are most accessible and most clearly pointed to as the places where we can break the chain, where we can be free from that, these um, 
places we feel locked, the places that we are entrapped in. And so I, I want to particularly tonight talk about one of them that is probably the most accessible place in a day-to-day -day life where we can unhook, where we can uh, become free from this um, going on, going on, going on. Um, and this is this is um, the link. It's the seventh link in in this chain of twelve, which is called Vedna. Vedna is often translated as feeling tone. It's not feelings like emotions, all of our thoughts and all of our emotional states. So feeling is not a great interpretation into English, but so that's why I use the word Vedana. It means three things in particular, only three things. Vedana means pleasant, unpleasant, and neither pleasant nor unpleasant. In short, we call that neutral sometimes. So pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. And everything we experience through our six sense doors that are part of this form, part of this human beingness, uh, we have the usual five sense doors of uh, hearing, taste, touch, smell, sight, hearing, taste, touch, sound, sight, and the mind is considered one of these six sense doors, which are the way that we make contact with the world, the way we know our world, the way we interact with the world through, if we're, is, you know, not everybody has all of the six sense doors. And so whatever sense doors we have is how we're connecting with the world. But it's in this, this one link of Vedna that we can break the chain. When we can just experience Vedna as Vedna, just knowing it, we can't, we can't uh, stop our contact with the world until we're dead. We're going to keep experiencing, interacting with everything and the, all of the whole cycle of life. So we can't stop that contact. We can't turn off our sense doors. Um, and we also can't stop Vedana, pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. These conditions, these ex the, this Vedana happens automatically and it ha happens for everybody all the time. But we don't have to add on to it. So I was watching this today when I was out walking. And my, my uh, I'm, I'm in downtown Toronto and my eyes landed on a pile of dog shit that was mushed, stepped on and mushed into the pavement. And I, and I was just really being open to watching Vedana coming and going. And I was like, immediately my eyes wanted to look away like, whoa, gross. It, it was just happened so quickly. And so that was an unpleasant sense door contact with the eye sense door. I could have added to that like, why don't people pick up after their dog or that's disgusting and poor dog has to crap on the sidewalk you know I could have really made a big story about it and gotten trapped in it or could just watch oh unpleasant and like uh, someone said earlier as we were chatting here in the zoom just naming it unpleasant um and then I was picking out what I was gonna have for dinner at a grocery store and just watching pleasant contact and how the either there could be smells, you know, um, something's baking or something or uh, 
depends on what 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 you like or don't like but uh, or just seeing something and watch how pleasant can so quickly become desire can become clinging uh we want to hold on to what we like and get rid of what we don't like and things that are neutral that are neither strongly pleasant or strongly unpleasant um are are places where we often don't pay attention at all we're just kind of so just noticing what am i not even paying attention to you know the texture of the wall i was walking by or the sound of the feet on the pavement or something that's you know wasn't strongly one way or another and just noticing oh this is neutral it's not strongly one way or the other and so it's because these experiences particularly of pleasant and unpleasant can almost immediately very quickly become become craving uh, um, and craving has two sides of the coin craving to get craving to not get or craving to get rid of it's really the same craving craving then becomes grasping um, the desire it conditions grasping and this is where we suffer so we were chatting earlier here about you know how do we what are some different ways that we free ourselves from from grasping when we know when we feel when we can feel in the body or in the mind that we're locked into something and what are the different tools we use to help uh, unlock that cage or to free ourselves from being stuck in a in an obsession or in a loop or in a strong desire or aversion or also numbing out to what's neutral and so the wisdom of the the sangha here the community that um, was naming the doing something physical so what is it about doing some some physical activity that helps free us from getting hooked into a, you know locking ourselves into a cage um you know it's mindfulness of body we're moving the body and paying attention to other experiences not just ruminating so doing something physical it also helps just move the energy of the body if if we're getting locked into tension um, but it it creates the first foundation of mindfulness mindfulness of body um well so uh someone was sharing the wisdom of hearing mindfulness of the of just turning attention to another sense door so it could be hearing or it could be the sensation of touch feeling our feet on the ground feeling the touch of breath so um something that anchors um, brings curiosity of attention to another something that's happening in the present moment rather than just letting the wheels run around into future and past and um creating more fuel for the suffering um curiosity and playfulness were other things that were described of uh working with putting the thoughts onto paper and getting creative with them and seeing their impermanence and seeing their condition arising by exploring other um other points of view other ways that that could be experienced um sharing with with safe people with dear people can help give us some perspective so we're not just in that hamster wheel of our own monkey mind um so there's many many pieces of wisdom um another really helpful piece that was shared here was a uh, to just give yourself this anchor to let it come whatever it is that's hooking us and let it come means it's already there so it's letting it be be known not pushing it away so there it's free of that grasping of pushing something away 
let it come, let it be here. It's like this right now. And everything that is the nature to arise is also of the nature to pass. Let it be its nature. Let it come, let it go. Seeing it's here, it's like this right now with kind attention, it's already, you're already less hooked in it. It's already changed. And change is by its own, by nature, um, release. Um, yeah, so there's many, many tools of wisdom here. And I personally work with these Vedanas often, and I find it really liberating, particularly to, I just name things for myself often like unpleasant. <laughs> That's unpleasant. And as soon as I do that, it's, I'm not hooked anymore. It's just like, oh yeah, you don't like it. Okay, what do you need? <laughs> you know, and then I take care of myself. Like just saying, oh, it's unpleasant is really freeing. So try that out if, it, if it's not something you've already explored. Um, the desire, so pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. So the pleasant ones are a harder place for me to unhook. I can, cause it, I really have to work a little more intentionally to see where's, where's the hook? Where have I bitten the hook when it's something I want? Because wanting is powerful in this conditioned being. Um, but I, I can get there, but it takes a lot more intention. Um, Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Joseph summarizes it similarly. When pleasant things arise, so when we see clearly with this dependent origination and, and are breaking this chain that's keeping us bound, then when pleasant things arise, we don't cling to them. We just see, oh, it's pleasant. It It's, we don't, get hooked and when unpleasant things arise he says we don't condemn and when neutral things arise we're not forgetful it takes a powerful mindfulness in every moment not to allow this vedna to generate desire so it really can be a moment a very daily practice it can give us his freedom many many times <laughs> through a day um and of course mindfulness is the key um what else uh lastly when there is no desire there is no grasping and without grasping there is no volitional activity of becoming this this is uh has to do with karma that is recreating a self. And if we're not generating that energy, then there's no rebirth and there's no aging, sickness, and death. And we become free because the condition for aging, sickness, and death is birth. If we're not re-becoming a self, then there's freedom in that moment in that moment it's just knowing oh this is arising this is passing this is pleasant this is unpleasant i want it i don't want it uh, this is neutral and i'm not awake to it okay of course, there's so much more to say to this, but just wanted to highlight this one little aspect of Vedana and its supreme importance. And uh, let's practice with it now in our meditation practice. So adjust your posture. Um, all right. 
So some folks like to turn away from the computer or dim your lights if you've been on a screen, especially a lot today. All right, and as you're settling into your posture, just take some time to see if you need any other movements or adjustments, any um, cushions or uh, supports for your body. And when you feel comfortable, supported, wakeful, then you can begin to settle into stillness or invite a sense of inner and outer stillness. Letting all of these words and concepts just settle like dust floating by let it go And really allowing yourself time to arrive, arrive and meet yourself in the present moment. So we do this by feeling the body. Perhaps inviting any tension that isn't needed right now to soften. Feel into, check into the areas of habit tension in your body, maybe in your face, shoulders, hands, belly. What is it for you? Where are the places where you get activated or locked into tension. Just check those out now for the next few moments and see if awareness meeting those tensions, they soften to some degree on their own. Let's check that out. Let the bones feel heavy and the skin and muscles soft. And when you're ready, begin to attune to the width of the body meeting the ground through the seat, the feet, legs wide and grounded and heavy. And then you might like to take a few moments to reflect on anything you've been caught up in or locked into lately. Is there any storylines or mind states or states of heart or body where you've kind of felt stuck? 
stuck in a, a loop of thinking, ruminating. You don't need to dig to find something, but just see if something is standing out that feels relatively recent that you can connect to. Check it out. Is it something that you were wanting that you didn't have or something you didn't want that was happening? Could be something happening in your world in your body, relationships. And perhaps with this reflection, it stands out or is accessible to notice, oh, there was, it just began with something unpleasant, unpleasant Vedana, or it began with something pleasant that I wanted to keep, or something neutral that I wasn't paying attention to. If it still feels sticky in your body, mind, you might take some time here to let it come, as was shared by one of the participants here. Just let that really be, be known. Oh, it's like this, or it was like this, with a tender attention. And in the same way that it was of the nature to arise, it is also of the nature to change. And so perhaps we can see that it has already changed. It's already gone. And in, if it hasn't, in what way have we been holding on to it? If it feels really tender or sticky, you might add a phrase of kindness, like, may I be gentle with this? Or may I take care of this, you know, fill in the blank, this grief or this difficulty? May I be patient with myself? Just see what's needed organically. And now we're just going to let go of that reflection. So we intentionally brought that into awareness, recalled it and brought it into heart awareness. And in the same way, we can just let it be of its nature and um, recede again. 
if you need a little more assistance to let that pass, you could have a little movement of maybe a hand at the heart or opening your eyes or touching your face. And then we'll shift to present moment awareness with how things are right now. So now we're just letting everything be however things are right now. What sounds are here? What sensations are here? Perhaps there's odors or scents. If you're sighted, what light or shapes are here? And what mind states are here? And then we're just going to rest in this place of beingness. And it may be that there won't be anything very disruptive coming into your sense doors in wherever you are. Um, but there could be thoughts. It could be that, you know, it's unpleasant that I'm speaking too much or something. And so you could just name it as unpleasant and let it just be that. Sounds could just be sounds. Sensations in the body could just be sensations. Thoughts in the mind could just be known as thoughts without pushing away or holding on or spacing out. Joseph Goldstein says, every moment of awareness is a hammer stroke on this chain of conditioning, striking it with the force of wisdom and awareness. The chain gets weaker and weaker until it breaks. Freeing our minds.
If the mind got hooked into any stories in that time of silence, see if there was a glimpse of knowing, oh, there was a pleasant thought that the mind wanted to hold on to and off it went. Or was there something unpleasant the mind wanted to figure out, work out, hold on to in that way? Or was there neutral thought, the, the, a boredom arose and fantasizing kicked in? If, if there's sensations in the body that are growing as we continue with stillness, it could be something as mundane as an itch or something stronger that feels like a pain. What? Just spend a few moments with it, seeing is it unpleasant and how quickly does the body want to get rid of it? And can we just... Give some space, a moment of curiosity with what does it really feel like? And in these last five minutes of the meditation, some of us may be experiencing more breathlessness or boredom or desire to do something else. And see if you can just name, is it pleasant, conditioned by something pleasant or unpleasant or neutral? And conversely, some may be experiencing some states of calm or peace or equanimity. And can that just be known, just let it be without clinging. Often these last few minutes of practice that are the most fruitful. So begin again.
as you hear the sound, notice if it's experienced as pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. And as you're ready, gently transitioning from your practice, or I should say from that form of the practice and continuing with practice, <clears throat> I also want to mention that um, Another thing I didn't like about this, no, not that I didn't like, but mm, made me reflect on in that image of uh, the person behind bars and reaching for, you know, they 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 look quite thin or emaciated, reaching for the loaf of bread. Is that there are prerequisites for practice that we do need to have nourishment and safety and medicine and rest. And so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, the image isn't quite mm, reflective of that because the person needed the bread, <laughs> you know, the, that we, yeah, so that's another whole Dharma talk, but um, and some of you have heard this one before as well, but uh, I remember um, on a, this was a month long silent retreat and I don't know which happens first, chicken or the egg, but the awareness brightens and we can watch sometimes the sequence of thoughts that happen in a flash like so fast this sequence like in seconds boom 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 these thoughts happen and I, I so I was able to see the chain that happened in just a matter of seconds and it was just from an eye contact of seeing a plant that has a soft fuzzy texture some call it lamb's ear puppy's ear is what I call it and um it was just was eye contact with the sense door and it was pleasant in that moment. And, and instantly I reached for it. So it was already with desire and wanting. So I was reaching for it, touching. And then the mind quickly made this whole succession of stories, remembering my dogs back home and then wondering if my partner had let them out and then imagining they'd gotten hit on the highway and I was pissed off instantly. And I was like, wow, wow, <laughs> that just happened like in seconds, just from a pleasant eye contact and went poof into, um, you know, it spun from pleasant into negative mind state. And I could have, I could have run with it for quite a while, but, you know, so we might not be able to catch this sequence in daily life. It's usually like after we're caught, <laughs> but you can still is very much usually after we're caught like we're already annoyed or we're already shopping or we're already eating or we're already bitching or whatever so but we can still stop it from going further we can still reflect back and go oh what was that oh yeah i just saw some purple boots wanted them now i'm in debt you know like we can reflect and try to start to unpack and notice it sooner yeah. Um, okay. So thanks for joining us. If you practice with us here on the YouTube channel and um, for folks on the Zoom, you're welcome to stay for a bit if you like. And uh, thanks for being here.